Hi everyone, my name is Grant and I'm the lead pastor of the Summit community. And we're grateful that you're engaging with this resource today. And our, our heart is that it's encouraging, that it's challenging and meaningful to you as a follower of Jesus. And to that end, we think that following Jesus is actually best done in the context of community. So this, this recorded sermon is intended to just be supplemental. And if there's anything we can do to help you uh, further engage in community and following Jesus with others, please let us know and we'd love to support that. So uh, as we open the word this morning or today, we hope that it blesses you. Uh, today's teaching text, if you have your paper Bible, is going to be in Matthew chapter 25. You can turn there now. Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 31. And I would just encourage all of us like to bring your paper Bible to church with you. Um, and it's not like because it's some sort of like merit system. It doesn't mean that you're like doing better than other people. We just want to be a people who know the word of God and know our story and how we're living it out and be familiar with where things are. So you're always free to follow along on the Sky Bible or bust out your digital uh, Bible on your phone. But I will tell you, if you use the digital, the U version, at some point you will open that thing in church and the audio will be going and you will be that person. And we will all mock you publicly. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I'll say this too, uh, this morning, this, uh, we added, I mentioned a couple weeks ago, we added, uh, welcomed our son into the world and uh, adding a fourth animal to the zoo that is the Brusco household, it has been at the detriment of my sleep patterns and habits. And this morning uh, I woke up to my wife, an elbow from Emily, dude, you gotta get up. And I was just like, ah! I'm like, it's 8.30, service already started, blah. And she, I was, it was good, I had like 30 minutes. But uh, I was just a tornado. And like, you know that feeling when you wake up late for something? No, none of you never do that. You're all super responsible. Uh, I was just, I was literally just running around, like brushing my teeth, putting a sock on. I'm just like, ah, where's the Bible? <laughs> and, uh, and the Lord just like stopped me. He was like, hey, just take a deep breath. The thing I like invite you to do with me all the time is like, hey, take a deep breath real quick. Just took a deep breath. And then I was just like bulldozed uh, with, the, with a reality. And I want to just tell you, like it is not lost on the folks who serve in the parking lot or show up and make coffee for us to consume or the tech team that works on this stuff, uh, the visual stuff uh, or, or online if you're watched that way or the, the, the worship team, like kids ministry, like it is not lost on any of us who are, are serving on Sundays that you choose to come here. And it is like a tremendous honor. And I was just like floored at the thought, at the reality that you choose to come here and entrust myself and the rest of the teaching team to teach the Bible to you. And I just wanna say thank you for trusting us. And it's, it's like a really a tremendous honor and privilege that I don't like, none of us who teach take lightly. It is like a very honoring and sobering reality that kind of puts us on our knees and says, God, thank you so much. Like, help me do this faithfully. And so as we get into today's text, I just wanna tell you, like our staff and our, our volunteer teams, like we just love you guys a lot. And it's a privilege to get to serve you in the, in the heart of the gospel. Um, oh, that's kind of you. And then I went back into tornado mode and got out of the house in time. It was pretty funny. I was like, oh God, that's so cool. All right, Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 31. Here's today's teaching text. Jesus said, but when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered in his presence. Pretty glorious scene here. And he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality? 
or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Then the king will turn to those on his left and say, away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, similarly shocked, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? When when was that? And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refused to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. Just a light topic this morning. So uh, years ago, I, true story, years ago, I found myself in a courtroom uh, appealing a charge against me uh, to a judge. And the judge listened to my appeal, uh, denied it, and then issued a judgment, dropped the gavel, and that was it. It was like, go. Go. It was, uh, it was pretty unsettling to stand before a judge. And if you've ever done it, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and that moment taught me something, uh, that facing judgment, it feels weighty, like it, because it demands accountability. And it's not something that any of us can just brush off. Now, I realize almost all of you didn't hear what I just said because you're wondering, what the heck did he do, right? So I'm gonna tell you, and uh, you got to keep it between you and me for this, okay? If you tell anybody else, I'll deny it. But uh, I was, uh, it was when I lived in Southern California and I was riding a bicycle on a public street at night down a hill without a helmet. And that is a crime there. So I was, the charge was you were riding a bike on a public street without a helmet. And it was like, I think it was like a $150 fine. So... I'm gonna say what I said (laughs) that you missed so that you can catch it again. That moment before the judge, it taught me something and it taught me that facing judgment feels weighty because it demands accountability. You have to take accountability for what you did or didn't do. And uh, I want, let's just talk about justice for a moment because I think justice is difficult for a lot of people and myself included. It's difficult to really define it with all of the variables and the complexities that are pertaining to it. But it's even more difficult to put justice into practice. But that has never stopped. That hasn't stopped human beings from trying to seek justice and trying to practice it and bring justice to bear on the world around us. I think humanity, whatever you believe to be true about Jesus, humanity has longed for justice. It's deep within us, especially in a world that is so uh, not as it should be, we ache for it to become or align to the world as it should be, right? You all have some mental image or vision of like a just world where people are not uh, oppressed, where injustice is not tolerated and it doesn't transpire. But there's a tension in this whole justice and judgment thing. And here's here's how I'll describe it. When, When someone else wrongs you, you want justice. But when you wrong someone else, you plead for mercy. We all do it. And one of my favorite movies of all time is The Sandlot. And I love the scene where Benny the Jet Rodriguez gets in the pickle where they're chasing him down. And that's kind of what this feels like. Like, I think in a lot of ways, we love the idea of justice, but we fear judgment and we're just kind of running between the two. I'm gonna say that again. I think we like the idea of justice, but we fear judgment, which is understandable. Judgment in nature, just the word itself, it carries a pretty heavy undertone with it, judgment. No one's like, yay, right? 
especially when it's enacted upon you. Like, uh, I will say this, judgment often carries an undertone because hear this, I think at its core, the function of a judge is to issue a just judgment. And the, the difficulty in that is a judge can issue a just judgment, but they can't really undo the injustice. But in theory, justice and judgment is good. Do you see that? Like if you desire justice, there needs to be a judgment to bring justice to bear on the situation. But our, our American legal system, really any human legal system, it just doesn't quite get to it. It's like, that's the best we can do. The biblical concept of living in a way that is as the world was intended, it, there's a term for that and it's called righteousness, living righteously. And it doesn't just have to do with you living, living well in a way that is good for you. It's living in a way that is well for yourself and everyone else. And so this image of biblical justice that is painted all throughout scripture it carries this undertone of you and I all living in a way that is actually what's best for us as well as everyone else included. That is the biblical image of righteousness and justice. So the presenting question I think in this is like, how do we do that? How do we live justly? How do we live righteously in this world? And I think that today's text that we just read, I think it barks up that tree. I think it gives us a really clear indication of what it looks like to live righteously and justly on this side of eternity. So here's a little context, because we kind of just dropped into uh, a, a context of teaching. What was transpiring prior to the passage that we read was Jesus issues uh, a series of what sorrow awaits you statements to the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees. So all the, the ancient church folk. And it's not pretty. He's like, you are blind guides. You are hypocrites. You are greedy. The outside looks really good. You put on a show, but the inside of you is corrupt. It's bad. And I would encourage you, if you're a follower of Jesus, to read through those woes and don't read them as Jesus dressing down someone else. If you're really there for it, would you read that and say, Jesus, do you have anything against me? Am I sideways? And would you graciously reveal it to me? So that happens. And then Jesus, uh, there's this moment where he looks out over Jerusalem and the people of God, and it says that he is just gutted. He is grieved, he is mourning, he is lamenting this reality that Jerusalem and the people of God have all out rejected God, his prophets and his messengers. And that just, that is a, a really tragic reality that Jesus doesn't just brush past. He's not just like, oh, well, he's like, this is so sad. This, this, this is like, when you look out at the world and you go, man, that is not what we should be doing. Jesus is seeing that. And then from there he moves, and as he's moving with his disciples, he passes by the temple. And if you remember a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the intended use of the temple, these physical buildings, and the intended use of the temple was worship of God. And Jesus makes a comment. He makes a comment in the direction of the temple buildings, and he goes, there will be a time when those buildings will be destroyed. So what will happen to the worship of God? If that's where that happens, what will happen? And it sparks a question that the disciples ask. And that question is, hey, tell us when the end of the age will come and what will it be like? And from there, Jesus launches into a progression of stories. He starts telling stories, describing what this future event will look like. And I'll say this, I think a lot of people have taken Jesus' block of teaching here on the end of days or end times, and they have ran in directions that Jesus never intended for people to run with. They're, it's bad interpretation. If, if the, the point of this block of teaching is not speculation, it's not like, oh, like here's, it's all here and there's this 
puzzle and this code that we have to solve so that I know when it's gonna happen and how it's gonna happen. It's not, the point isn't speculation. The point isn't either escapism. It's not, dude, just get me out of here before this world goes to hell. That's not what Jesus is doing. And it's also not, hmm, it's, how would I say it? It's not, the point of this block of teaching is not, there is some secret hidden knowledge that if you obtain it, you are now in the know and everyone else doesn't. The point of this block of teaching is for Jesus to equip us with the knowledge of what this will look like and to live in a way and steward our lives in a way that when this day or moment comes, we can say with confidence we have lived well in the meantime. So when it comes to the end of the age, it's not about speculation or escapism or some secret hidden knowledge. It's about preparedness and readiness, not necessarily in a prepper sense, but that you know. And it's about stewardship and awareness. So as it pertains to the teaching text that we looked at today, there's three truths that I just want to invite us to A, wrestle with. There's a wrestle. There's a godly wrestle. To wrestle with these truths and to work to absorb them into our mind and our spirit. And the first truth is this. Each of us will give an account for our life and Jesus will serve as judge. Each of us will give an account for our life and Jesus will serve as judge. So in that text we read, we saw Jesus is, he's describing a, a future moment. And it's this picture that he paints of himself, the son of man sitting on the glorious throne, all of God's angels present. And then as well, all of human beings, all the nations across all of time, like the whole crew is gonna be there. And there's a separation that takes place. He says that the sheep will be placed on the right and they are representing those who lived righteously. And the goats will be placed on the left representing those who did not. And this moment is sobering. There's, there's a finality to it. Each of us will give an account for how we lived. And there's no proxy. It's not like, hey, I'm gonna have my grandma fill in for me on this. It's you. <laughs> with, with nothing undisclosed, no stone not turned over, nothing hidden, you standing before the judgment seat of Christ. And I think for some people, perhaps you maybe right now as you're listening to this, this invokes fear in some people. Maybe you're anxious and you're scared in the thought, at the thought of this, and that's understandable. It is unsettling. I mean, where will I be in this separation? And what about the people I love? And I, there's, it's a big deal. And I, I just wanna tell you, like, I don't think in all of my study and praying and wrestling, I don't think Jesus is saying this. He's not informing us of a future judgment in an attempt to scare the hell out of us literally and metaphorically. That's not it. He's saying this really plainly because his heart is that we would accept the knowledge of this reality. You need to know this. You need to know that to a person you will give an account for your whole life to Jesus. And scripture states very clearly that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Jesus isn't saying this to strike terror in you, but he is saying it so that you might fear him in a healthy awe and wonder way. And perhaps if you're feeling fearful right now, this is a moment where you are given an opportunity to begin a lifelong journey in the way of wisdom in the Lord. So that fear, that unsettled notion that you feel, I, I get it, I feel that but it's not bad, it's okay. Stay in the fight, don't run away from that. And I actually would say that in my assessment, the, that him telling us, him giving us knowledge in this text of a future judgment, it's a tremendous act of kindness and love. 
uh, if, just play with me here for a second. If, if I knew, if I had firsthand knowledge, and none of you knew this, that all of 29th in the last 15, 20 minutes you've been in here, it has turned into an absolute sheet of ice. And at the end of our time together, I say, would you stand with me? I give a benediction and I just go, hey, drive safe. Is that loving or kind? No, you need to know that information. You need to go, hey, dude, if you drive on 29th right now, it is not gonna be safe. It's not gonna be good. And if you found out two weeks from now that I knew that, would you be happy with me? No. You're like, man, you're such a loving, kind pastor. I really appreciate that. No. So Jesus is giving you knowledge of something. So while we acknowledge that the, the fact of this judgment is unsettling, I hope that you hear it as a divine act of loving kindness of God giving you a heads up. Like right now in this room, none of us are gonna be able to go, I didn't know. We all heard it. We're all wrestling with that reality. And others of you, you might not be stricken by fear and overwhelmed with worry and anxiety or, or nervousness right now. Some of you might be thinking, what the heck? This makes no sense. I, I can't accept this. I cannot accept the, the possibility of a good and loving God separating people and saying to some, you will inherit what was prepared for you from the beginning of time. And to others saying, you are cursed and you will inherit what was created for Satan and the demons. This is incongruent, I will not. And this has led, this is a real wrestle. This has led many people into a state of wrestle and then back up and back up and you find yourself in the basement of deconstructionism and you never step back out into the light of faith again. That's, that, and I just am saying, that's okay if this is where you are right now, but stay in the fight. Stay here with me. Because I agree with you. It does seem incongruent. You're not wrong in that assessment. However, I do think that if you stay in the fight and you really wrestle with scripture, I think that notion of incongruency, a loving God separating people and judging them, it comes from a warped perspective regarding the majesty of the wrath of God. Because you might be like, man, this just feels like God is a vindictive judgment of retribution. Like I'm finally gonna give these people what they deserve. That couldn't be the furthest thing from the heart of God, the heart of Jesus described throughout the whole of scripture. And we already just discussed and wrestled with, if you'd long for justice, there needs to be a just judgment. Otherwise it's always gonna be kinda not it. Jesus is not some nasty hall monitor in an elementary school just trying to catch you in without your hall pass. Like, that's not who he is. Scripture says that he is merciful. He, he is full of compassion. He is slow to anger, filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. He is patient with us. My God, he is so patient with us. He is... His heart is that no one would be destroyed, but that all would repent. So this knowledge, my friends, I think, I'll say this because I have a little bit of time because I went quick there. Something that's cool about Hebrew language is that it's, it's unique from English language in that phrases paint these really beautiful word pictures and depictions. So when I just said that, that, that God is slow to anger, in the Hebrew word and the way that is phrased, it gives this mental image of God being long in the nose. And I will tell you, you, you I, one of the greatest tools that I have at my disposal when I am feeling angry with my children is a long nose. There is something sacred about when someone's driving you nuts and you wanna just drop the hammer on them, when you go, Hey, everybody. And if you're a teacher, you know what I'm saying. If you spend time with young children or just any adult, like we are, we bug each other. 
We, we execute injustice against each other all the time, and we have against God. Romans says very clearly that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and thank God he's long in the nose toward us. Jesus, I think what he's doing here is he's giving us knowledge of a coming judgment and it's intended to draw us toward a saving grace. Not, not terrorize us with fear and not put us in this uh, incongruency wrestle. And remember who's overseeing this whole judgment, it's Jesus. And Satan, as well as the world, threw everything and the kitchen sink at him in an attempt to corrupt him. And we, like our, our media, we are obsessed with corruption because it's everywhere. And we don't trust anybody or anything anymore with due reason in a lot of ways. But this is not some corrupt judge overseeing this judgment. This is Jesus. There's not gonna be any funny business in this judgment. He didn't accept a briefcase so that your judgment will go one way or the other. It is going to be the most pure, righteous, and just judgment that the world will ever experience. The second truth that we need to hear, it kind of emerges out of verses 35 through 40, where in what we read, the king commends the sheep for their acts of kindness, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, caring for the sick, and visiting the imprisoned. And remember, when the righteous were kind of surprised, they're like, man, when did we ever serve you when you were naked and needed clothing? The king, who is representing Jesus here, he says, whatever you did for the least of these, you did unto me. And that's huge. It's so big. He's essentially saying that all these small, seemingly insignificant acts of charity and solidarity and generosity, every one of those acts of service, Jesus counts as service rendered unto him. Because on the cross, he was as poor and as naked and as hungry and as isolated as sin could make a human being. And he's going, when you do that toward each other, it's service rendered unto me. This is super helpful information, guys. Super helpful. Like if, I, if you and I signed up for a college course, we roll in, we sit down, the teacher for weeks never gives us a rubric. We know there's a grade coming at the end of the semester. We have no idea the basis we will be graded upon. So you and I are sitting there and it's like, is the final supposed to be, is it like 50 page research paper? I'm gonna go with five. Five seems appropriate, probably 14 font, double space, that's doable. I'll do that. What about sources? I don't know, no idea. I heard someone say something one time, I'm just gonna source that and quote that. It would be absurd to sit in a class and be like, I have no idea. What Jesus is doing here is he says, hey, here's knowledge of a future judgment. And then this is the second truth we have to wrestle with and absorb. The criteria upon which you and I will be judged is our treatment of other people. Because did you notice they're both surprised? When did we do this? And he goes to their treatment of others. Man, people were sick and they were hungry and they were lonely and they were isolated. And you stepped toward them. That is the criteria upon which we will be judged. And I'll say this, I think Satan would love nothing more if he were able to deceive you and I into treating our salvation like a Willy Wonka ticket to heaven. And, and here, let me just explain what I mean here. You all understand the concept of the Willy Wonka ticket, right? Charlie opens up the chocolate bar, I got it, I can get in. And this is in effect what that looks like with salvation. Man, I prayed a prayer and it was genuine and it was serious and it was heartfelt. I prayed a prayer. I confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior. And I'm gonna tuck this, this ticket for entrance into the pearly gates. I'm just gonna tuck it in a safe spot so that when the day comes, I can go, hey, I'm good. But in the meantime, I'm gonna do me. And if you cross my path and I don't like you, if you cross my path and you do something nasty to me, or if I cross your path and I have what you lack and I just walk right by, it's uh, tough, man, because I got my ticket. Willy Wonka ticket salvation, it, this is what it does to you and I over time. It causes us to grow increasingly cold toward other people over time. 
Not my problem. I got a fridge full of food. Not my problem. I was responsible and I worked hard and I saved my money. That's tough. And it somehow creates this insidious justification that we can engage in relationship with other people and God doesn't care about it. So now we all have knowledge of a future judgment and we all know the basis on which we will be judged and it will be your treatment of other people. But please don't misunderstand what I'm saying or what Jesus is saying here. You and I cannot earn our salvation by good deeds. However, we will be accountable for neglecting to live out our salvation in how we love and care for other people. Willy Wonka ticket salvation, it's cheap. We cannot reduce our salvation to insurance. I'm good, man, I'm covered. Salvation is an ongoing relationship. You are saved and being saved. And the place where that salvation is proved or lived out is in how you treat other people. Don't miss that. That cannot be lost on us because that is what we will give an account for. And first John, John reminds us of this. He says this, he says, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need, but shows zero compassion, how could God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth. So we will be confident, get this, we will be confident when we stand before God. Love and care of others is an expression, and I would maybe argue the expression, this side of heaven, of our salvation. And if you remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the intended use of the temple was for worship of God, but what the temple leaders had done is they separated their treatment of people from their worship of God. It's the same thing going on here. If you try to separate your treatment of people from the free gift of your salvation, it's, it's an indictment against you. There's probably a woe in that and a chance for you to check yourself before what the famous prophet says, you wreck yourself. It's a good thing. You should go, man, take some stock. And I want you to get this. Here's the deal. Notice what Jesus says regarding the criteria. These are basic fundamental needs. You gave me food, you gave me water, you gave me clothing, you gave me shelter, you gave me connection when I was lonely. Like guys, I was never good at school. But if this is the criteria on which we were being judged for and will be judged for in light of God's love for us, I don't know about you, but I'm like, I can do that. You're, you, I might be a valedictorian for the first time in my life because God's love is so wildly, audaciously deep and unending toward a sinner and a wretch like me. I understand how broken I am. And you're telling me that your love for me then in turn is going to supply a grace and a motivation to love other people. Dude, guys, we can do this. This isn't a class that's beyond your pay grade. Jesus doesn't say, hey, I was sick and you performed a miracle and healed me. I was in prison and you broke down the walls and liberated me. These aren't these massive miracles. They're little ministries that you and I are capable of living out. That is, that is the subversive nature of the kingdom. There's this insidious notion that we need to live these really big, large, influential lives. We need to be charismatic crowd gatherers. We need to wow the world to make a difference for the kingdom of God. And Jesus dismantles that right here. He's like, no, you don't. It is in the small, ordinary, simple acts of serving people right around you that my kingdom comes to bear. It's absurd. I'll say this, like when I first got out of drug rehab, here's, here's an encouragement. I would encourage you to go read Exodus or Ezekiel 34. And this will make sense if, as you read this this week. I had no idea. I had never taken Jesus serious a day in my life. 
I get out of rehab and I have no idea how sick, how hurt, how wounded, and how hungry I was. But I had an, inner, an encounter with Jesus at three o'clock in the morning all by myself. And it changed the trajectory of my life. Like face down in a gutter, nowhere to go, nothing going on. And I said, God, if you are real, dude, I need you, man. <laughs> Help me, please. I don't know up from down. I don't know who I am. I don't know why I live on this earth. If you are actually real, show yourself, please, I beg of you. And what happened in that time is I got connected to this really small church community, less than 20 people. They met in a, in a boathouse in the Dana Point Harbor in Southern California. It was like the weirdest church to walk into for the first time. It's like, what's going on, dude? Like, it felt like a weird family dinner. But this community, they embraced me. They brought me in. They were kind to me. They invited me over for dinner. They bought me a shirt when I didn't have a dollar to my name or anything. I remember they invited me over for Thanksgiving and I'm like, are you sure? Like we just met. Like I forgot to, did, you, did you, was that lost on you that I've been like a five year drug addict? Like I might fleece your whole house and steal everything from you. Are you sure you're cool with that? And they're like, yeah, man, you gotta come over. And just so you know, like we believe that turkey is an inferior meat and we are prime rib people on Thanksgiving. And I'm like, I will be there. <laughs> like, but he, and here's what's wild is like, according to what Jesus said, those small acts of that community, unknown to me, and probably even to that small group of people, those acts of basic service unto me, I was, I was attending to, I was experiencing Christ in them because he had served them and that's what motivated them to love me the way they did. And the turn of this whole story is that according to Jesus, they were attending to Christ in me. They were serving him by caring for the least of his. Guys, we can do this. The question is, are we willing to participate with God in what he's doing in the world? Are you willing to demonstrate your salvation in the way that you love and serve others? I think it would be, I think it would be foolish of me to just assume, for us to assume, that all of us are just gonna walk out of here today and if an opportunity to serve someone crosses our path, we're just gonna do it impulsively. Sure, that happens and praise God when that happens. But I would just ask you, like, is there someone you know by name in your life whom the Holy Spirit is putting a light bulb over their head and saying, step toward them. And it, I, it, he doesn't say, hey, be everything, do everything for that person, but he does say, do something. What can you do? And do that. The final truth that I want us to just wrestle with today, it, it has to do with the outcome. The outcome of this judgment. So we saw that there will be a judgment. We have knowledge of that. We know the criteria. We aren't gonna be surprised. It's your treatment of other people. And then this result, the king says to those on the right, he says, come all you who are blessed by my father and inherit the kingdom prepared for you before the creation of the world or from the creation of the world. This is the thing I want you to wrestle with with me. There is a righteous end that God designed for you. There is a righteous end that God designed for you. Heaven. And heaven is not merely good because it isn't hell, guys. And I think sometimes early on or at times it's like, oh man, I just really don't wanna wind up in hell, so I'm gonna grab onto Jesus because that's better than hell. Heaven is good because it's the home that you were always, cre always intended to inhabit. You were never intended to not live in the presence of God. It's like through Jesus, through Jesus, everything that was lost in Genesis 3 has been restored and redeemed. And we all have been invited back home. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, he's essentially saying, hey, I made a way back home. You don't have to be lost. Just trust me. Yeah, but dude, what if I mess up on the criteria? What if I don't, dude, my grace is sufficient. Just trust me. 
and I will teach you how to love other people the way I've loved you. I don't know, man, I don't know, just trust me. I wanna recall my opening illustration with you to close this sermon. If you could just imagine me before that judge and as the judge starts to announce my sentence, the judge goes, you know, Grant, you 100% are guilty of riding a helmet without a bicycle. (laughs) Or, (laughs) you, guys, this is gonna be a really powerful moment. You're messing it up. But if, if the judge goes, hey, you 100% are, you're guilty. You rode a bicycle without a helmet and here in San Juan Capistrano, that's a law. You broke the law and you, you admitted it, you owned it. You were accountable to that. The police report, yep, you got pulled over on a bike. You're the first person in human history that's ever happened to. <laughs> but imagine that judge going, but here's the deal. The, the sentence, the judgment doesn't change. It has, the, the, this has to be, this judgment has to be declared in order for justice to happen. But my love for you, Grant, says this judge, my love for you is, it's far more potent than you could ever comprehend at this moment. But here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna announce the judgment and after I announce the judgment, I'm gonna actually vacate my judgment seat. And I'm gonna walk off the bench and I am going to receive the judgment due to you. That would be absurd. And I, I don't know all the legalities, but I'm pretty sure like a circuit judge would, that's a, that's a crime, I think. I don't think they can do that. Okay, I, it's absurd to consider that. That is exactly what Jesus has done for you and I. That's the gospel. And it's crazy because we stand there and like when we're, when we're trying to be accountable, we're like, yeah, I'm accountable. We aren't convinced that we're lovable. Not like that. And that's the gospel. That's the good news that we share with other people. That's what we walk out of here and get to live as the aroma of Jesus in this city. Because I tell you, I have, I have enough friends in the, a secular profession of counseling. And I can tell you this, if you boil down every counseling appointment, the person, regardless of what they're wrestling with, at the core is this haunting question that says, I don't think I'm lovable. I don't think I'm lovable. I have been pummeled my whole life by myself, by the lies of Satan. I have been pummeled with the lie that I'm not lovable. And I don't think any of us, I don't think I could, if you are in a place where you're like, I don't think I'm lovable, Grant, I just can't buy the whole gospel thing. I don't think I could probably convince you in a thousand lifetimes that you're lovable, but I do know this for a fact. I've been where you are. I know that so well. And I do know this for fact, as real as the air you and I breathe, Jesus is capable of convincing you that you are lovable. And it can be an unconfident whisper. And he will be patient and kind and gracious with you all the days of your life, proving to you over and over and over again that you in fact are lovable. And he vacated his judgment seat against you first so that you could be shown mercy. And his mercy triumphs over his judgment in that moment but it doesn't mean that that judgment will never happen. There is an opportunity for all of us to respond to the gospel. And so we get to be people who've received the love of Jesus and become increasingly convinced that we in fact are lovable. And you get to share that with other people. And back to the never been very good at school illustration. You were, you were made to live out the criteria of your judgment. You don't have to be freaked out by it. You are really good at caring for people when you receive the love of God for you. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me? Let's take a deep breath together. May we be confident in the hope of our salvation. 
may we be people who live out our salvation in the way that we treat other people. And may you hear this, may you be unendingly convinced that you are lovable. And would you live in such a way that you give that love away like you have nothing to lose. Pour it all out in the hope that other people would experience the goodness of Jesus. Amen? Amen. I love you guys. If you'd like to pray, we have our prayer team and they would love to serve you in that way. Have a good week, everybody. Hey, we are so glad that you found us online and joined us today. At Summit, we aim to be a people that are attentive to the Spirit and sensitive to the voice of God. So if while you've been with us today, the Spirit's been putting on your heart that it's time to dive deeper, I'd encourage you to fill out the Connect card. Just scan the code on the screen and this is your way to get a call from a pastor. This is how we can pray with you and partner with you where you're at. But if you're really looking to go deeper, I can tell you that on our YouTube and on our website, we have all of our sermon archives, and this is a great way for you to dive into scripture and learn more about God. We again are a people led by God and you can follow with us on our journey. So if you're local, we would love to meet you. We'd love to see you in person. And if you're not local, um, we believe that church is best done in person when we can see each other. And so we'd honestly encourage you to pray about finding a community in your own city, a place where you can be known and know others. But we love you. We're so glad we got to spend some time with you today. Have a great rest of your day and we'll see you next week.